evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Stockholm Syndrome is defined as when hostages develop a psychological alliance or identify with their captors. The new film, Stockholm, starring our next guests, Ethan Hawke and Numi Rapaz, and directed, written and directed by Robert Boudreau, explores this dynamic by telling the story of the actual bank heist that led to the term being coined. Take a look. Ask him what they want. He's asking what you want. I want him here in 10 minutes or I shoot you in the face and then hang up. Tell me. He wants you here in 10 minutes or he shoots me in the face. Was he surprised? I mean, did he sound surprised? An American with a machine gun has taken over Credit Banker. Credit Banker? Get here! Get on the ground! You! You've been shot. No, she hasn't been shot. She's obviously got a muscle cramp or something. Get her a banana and get everybody out of here. We will let the ladies go when it's over. You want money? One million US dollars. Then a Mustang 302 like Steve McQueen had in Bullet. Yeah, I like that movie. <laughs> you disabled the cameras? You think I should have? Have you done this before? Do I look like an idiot? The girls, have, have they been harmed? Yes. Why would they say that? Cops lie to get what they want. Turn it off, off right God. God. All of Sweden would like to know, what is it like being stuck in there with those criminals? It's not too bad. <laughs> he let me call. He didn't have to. You and the others will survive, and I can go home. You are unbelievably brave, you know. Can't you feel it? But you trust them? More than we trust our police. If they want our help, they need to show us some respect. And if the police comes in and they start shooting, he will shoot back. I'm not going back to prison. OK, I got to kill someone. What? He's like a child. Remember the Alamo. Woo! Everybody, please welcome writer, director Robert Bujero, Numi Rapaz, and Ethan Hawke. Hey. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on this film, which uh, doesn't go in any direction that I think is expected from the start, that is expected for a bank heist movie, that is expected for a movie about Stockholm Syndrome. I mean, you set it up well when you say based on an absurd true story. but. Uh, where did, how did you find this story? What interested you in it? What, uh, take me back to the moment where you were like, I want to explore Stockholm. Um, there's a producer who had optioned this article uh, in The New Yorker by Daniel Lane called The Bank Drama. And it was this great 40 or 50 page article that um, he had gone to Sweden in 74 and interviewed everybody after this incident. And it was just such a strange story with such rich characters that I was immediately drawn to it. Did you think of you know previous bank heist movies at all while you were writing this, or did you try to keep those out of out, out of sight, out of mind, so you could sort of create your own thing? I tried, but I mean it's pretty hard to not um, think about Dog Day Afternoon, which happened in '73 at a similar time and is a similar situation. So that was obviously the film that um, I thought about the most and probably talked to these guys about the most. Numi, uh, you do something, I think, pretty phenomenal with your character, which is that you let us empathize with a woman who is also kind of a blank slate when we meet her, and she almost feels a little bit like a blank slate up until the point where she ends up identifying with Ethan Hawke. Can you talk about who this woman was to you and sort of crafting that performance? Yeah, I mean, it feels like she, she, uh, she awakes through those events, it's almost like she gets like oxygen into her soul and her world and she becomes her true self, strange enough, through this like very kind of violent <laughs> event. And and he wakes her up. She starts she connects with things in herself that she didn't know she had. It's so interesting because she is an awake person in a lot of ways when we meet her. She's got a family. She's got okay. a job. She's a, a good mother. But there has to be this sort of like untangible thing inside of her yeah. that, we're that she's searching for that the movie itself almost can't even 
define. It just has to totally. literally be in your eyes. Yeah, and I also think that time in the 70s, like women, I think back then were quite repressed. I mean, they were supposed to be in the background and, and not kind of speak up. And all of a sudden she's on the phone with the prime minister and, and she falls for this man and it feels like, you know, the rebellious side in her kind of awakens. So it's a quite powerful and really, really interesting journey. And she's so layered and so complex and strange. And and uh, yeah, I, lo I loved I loved her. <laughs> yeah. um, Ethan, I feel like you're you're an actor who loves to play. Even when you're doing intense drama, you get the sense that you are trying things and being really playful in your roles. But in this role specifically, you are sort of gung ho, a comic force. <laughs> uh, can you talk about doing a kind of a comedy like this? Did you see it as a comedy? I did. I, I I'm not sure anyone else did at first, but I, I thought the situation was incredibly funny. And when I was a kid and I first started acting, I really imagined that I would be a comic actor. That was my impression. You know, I remember being young and seeing Warren Beatty in Shampoo or something and thinking like, I just thought that was so funny. And John Cusack and these performances I really loved and somehow, Dead Poet Society came out, and I started playing serious people, and I liked that, and I was good at it, um, or I thought I was good at it. Um, but I've been waiting for a chance to do a comic performance for a long time, and part of what makes it work is that it's a drama. There's some people that are innately funny, and I'm not that, but I love acting so much that if the situation is funny, and Numi's character was so real, and I. I actually think the realer I was, the funnier the situation got. It's just, you had to get rid of all the bank heist artifice, the posing. He's a guy who wants to pose. Yeah. He's playing a bank robber. He thinks it's cool. He watched Easy Rider too many times. He's also he, telling people he's posing at times as well. In yeah, a way, right? you know, I, it, I found the character so interesting. And so in a way, I knew it, ideally it would be funny, but I didn't approach it like a comic I wasn't trying I was trying to play him as realistically as possible and the juxtaposition of our two characters her seriousness m his outrageousness hopefully would be funny just being in a bank it's so d boring in banks it's so repressed mm -hmm. to try to be a guy in a wig Rob I mean I don't know I, I thought it had an opportunity to be something I hadn't seen before I'm I'm curious. Is it difficult as a as a director, or do you ever worry about your center, your main performance being anarchic and very like pretty silly in a very straight world? I mean, it, you're always concerned about the tone of your film, especially right from day one. When I read the article, I knew it was a bit of a tricky tone, and so that was always something that was on my mind. But you know, Ethan and I had worked together on a past movie called Born to Be Blue, and so. Um, you know, I got to know his performances in cutting that movie. And you also know that you want to take chances. If you want the, the fun comedy, you've got to try some things. And, you know, you can edit and you can tailor it. And so I just tried to be open to see what he could bring. It's the only way to find that stuff. Can I ask, you said that you got to know his performances when editing that movie. Can you give us an example or what? tell us what you mean by that? He means sometimes I do really dumb things that don't work. <laughs> and that sometimes that translates into something that will work. I mean, that's what I, I think. But you also have this extreme bravery. You just go for it. I mean, some actors want to be safe and they, they don't want to jump and like try something that is not really there yet. And it feels like for me, it was so inspiring working with you because you're just like insanely brave. Well, I, thank you for saying that. But I, I believe that if you want to get something that you don't expect, like if, whenever you watch an actor or a performance and you think, oh, I bet that was really good when they did it in their mirror, you know, at, at home, yeah. it's not very interesting. Mm. If it's something you can think of, it's not, it has to be something that we come up with together, something that you didn't think of, that I didn't think of, that you didn't think of, but it came together because of the intersection of all three of us or for whoever's in the scene. Then, the, then spontaneity can happen. And so I'm always hunting for that. And to do that, you have to make an asset of yourself. Some, you have to risk... Uh, being foolish. Can I ask, are you, are you an actor who asks questions on the set? Like if you get a, di a direction or a note, do you ask questions or do you just sort of try it and see what happens? What, 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 what do you think? I mean, there's, there's always a certain dialogue, but um, I think, you know, this is a movie because it was limited locations we shot chronologically. So the first day Dude, was- Wow, you shot chronologically? Well, yeah, for the most awesome. part. Yeah. 
Um, it, it was easier because there was only two locations. But the first day was the entire bank robber scene, which is probably the biggest, most improvised aspect of the movie anyways. And, um, you know, I think it was really great for the actors not to know what Ethan was going to do because Numi would come up to me and say, like, <laughs> she had to act in the moment because yeah. that's part of being scared yeah. and part of the terror and the comedy is, like, not knowing what the hell this bank robber is going to do. And I, you know, I, I wanted to kind of foster that because there's a certain electricity in that. I had an amazing experience once directing a play and three actors were in it and they all individually came over to me to complain about the other two. <laughs> do you, do you, you know, like, well, yeah. what she's doing, I can't, I can't do what I want to do. And I, I think, yeah, right, that makes perfect sense. And, and then the other one would say, why is she doing that? And why is he doing that? And I realized the scene was so good. And I realized it was because yeah. they, they, not, they weren't doing yeah, what yeah, the yeah, other yeah. one expected them to do. And so they were forced to react in a way that they couldn't anticipate, which actually made them more dynamic to watch. Mm -hmm. And I just kept lying to all of them, saying, you know, I talked to her. She's going to stop doing that. <laughs> and, 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 and they would come back, what? And I go, I know. I don't, I don't know. And then finally they started just realizing that it was working. Did you go back and look at Dog Day Afternoon? Did you think about Pacino or other other bank robbery movies, or or the sort of like um, befuddled criminals? There is a you know, genre. You know, of, I didn't, I, sadly, I watched Dog Day After between the ages of twenty one and twenty three. I think I watched Dog Day Afternoon like nineteen times. Yeah, I mean, fair, I, fair. I, I, I and I got to work with Sidney Lumet at the end of his life, and I got to ask him questions about those performances, and that's kind of the bar for old school, what you, I would call New York acting, mm -hmm. you know, what, what they were up to, all, all the people in that movie. And it's invariable, it's a high bar, but anytime you do, doesn't mean you shouldn't try, you know? Yeah, so you weren't necessarily shooting for that performance, but it was in the back of your head a little bit. You've that seen movie's different, times. I mean, they're similar in the location, but the characters, you, Agree. I mean, I think this is very much a love story. I mean, yeah, that's how, exactly. When yeah. our first conversation, I mean, we started straight away talking about, like, these two people and this strange love story, and that was something you kind that's of... That's what makes our movie human and different. Yeah. It's like, yeah. And, and it, it does seem so strange that they would fall in love in this situation, but the more you explore it, it seems so obvious and human. Yeah. Yeah. Their lives are at risk, mm. and they both are well-meaning, and they're... It, it, I mean, it was also because we shot it. I mean, we were trapped in this bank for, like, six weeks, and I felt like, we, I mean, when I came out in I daylight know. after those six weeks, I felt like slightly like crazy. Like a crazy person. But it also felt like, I mean, the Stockholm Syndrome, this syndrome almost happened to me. Like, in the beginning, I felt like I was very much, like, you know, kind of wary about you, and I was like, what is he doing? I mean, it's... A bit scary. It's a. It's a bit like. At the end, we were having so end. much fun. Yeah, and I, and I was like <laughs> totally like merged into you and like totally on your side. It's so, so interesting. You guys saw it as a love story. Yeah. yeah. That's so fascinating. As a viewer, I got. I just sort of never saw it as a love story. Like just because I saw their struggle and what they were going through to be so so much about who they were mm -hmm. personally, and then they had right. to come together. In but this inside moment, of it, what th that's the right reaction to have watched the movie. But as the people playing it, right. what was happening to mm -hmm. them was the the intersection of these two people, mm -hmm. and that's what made it alive for us to mm -hmm. play, mm -hmm. and made the movie original. You yeah. know. How, what was the toughest part about shooting this movie, especially in one location? You do have these wonderful moments where you break it up stylistically. I think of the one scene around the table where we're doing a kind of classic spiraling around the table as everyone's talking. Um, but how difficult was it to sort of find new styles or break up the way, the look of it? It's, it's always a challenge that I welcome, it, like when you shoot in limited locations, just to keep it... Um, you know, keep it exciting. It, it means in the edit you have to think a lot about pacing, so it was something. And, you know, when do you take a breath of fresh air and cut outside, or when do you not? Because sometimes just staying close to that POV creates a certain amount of tension. Um, you know, the other challenge was just making people believe that we were in Stockholm because we shot it outside of Toronto for the most part. I mean, which wasn't that hard, but because it was all interior, but getting people to believe that we're in the early 70s in Sweden was one of our kind of technical challenges. Really? Um, uh, yeah, just... Is just wardrobe and... Well, no, it's also just, you know, the, the film opens with Ethan's character kind of coming through Stockholm, which we yeah. did shoot for a few days in Stockholm, which helped. But it's always a challenge when you're not shooting it where the story takes place and in the time it takes place to transport people to that time and era. And Stockholm at that time in the early 70s was such a different weird, innocent kind of place. 
it's hard to imagine. I think pe people sometimes think that that's part of the goofiness of the film is that they were so innocent and the police were so inept, but that's... I mean, That's I grew really up in, I'm, like. I'm Swedish and I grew up in Sweden. I, <laughs> I was very aware of those events, like from early age. And, and I mean, that was kind of, Sweden was very innocent until this point. So after this, it was the first time, like, the police force and the politicians became a big, big thing. And, and, and they realized how undeveloped, like, the police force was and that it was unorganized and, like, they didn't really know how to communicate. And, you know, just the fact that one of the hostages is on the phone with the prime minister. It's quite trippy. Did, was it well known in Sweden afterwards that they had developed, forged a relationship together as oh, well? Yeah. 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 People I mean, I grew up wanting to play this part. I, uh, when I was when I started acting, it was like a dream role. And I remember I watched like a, it was like a TV film film made when when I was like 19. And I was like, oh no, no, like it's done now. And then you came to me. It was like, wow, it's coming back to me. So it's it's pretty big. Yeah, it was like. I do think it's invaluable to the movie. Y your performance is the heart of the movie and your intelligence about that period and what it means was we would have been lost without you. I mean, I think one of the things that Robert was saying is that it is hard to be in Toronto. You have a lot of people who are playing Swedish characters that aren't Swedish. And, and so how do you get inside that and not mock it or, or pretend? You know, whenever you start pretending, you're off base already. And, and Numi had understood so much about this world, this woman, this moment in time that sh she became a well for us, a well of knowledge. You know? It never seemed to me like, like I always believed that it was Stockholm, I always believed the setting, but it never felt like a forced thing that you were trying to do, that you were really trying to push the time period and really trying to push Stockholm. Like it was still somewhat subtle. Well, that's good. I mean, that means we did our job because you, you don't want it to stand out. You don't want the costumes to be too kitschy. You don't want the locations to be hit on the head. You just want it to feel natural. And at some of the film festivals, a lot of people said that, oh, what was it like shooting the film in Stockholm? And I said, well, we didn't. And so that, that was, you know, that was good. We had a couple days, you said, right? Yeah, a couple days. But, you know, for me... It was me, wonderful when we got to Stockholm. Just, I, I, my hotel was wrong. The place I didn't... I came with my daughter, you, yeah. you remember? And Numi made, Numi made a couple calls, and I had the <laughs> best suite in Stockholm, man. I was, she, I, was, I realized, oh, man, I was set up. That was very good. Queen well, of that city. city. You could, yeah, you, <laughs> you run that city, Numi? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny. I, I, um, I live in London now, and, and I got a phone call from Stockholm yesterday, and they're dying to have you for the Swedish premiere. Yeah, yeah. Like, you're like, you're such a, like... Well, it, they love uh, you over there. They uh, love you. <laughs> so, um, This being your guys' second film together, is there like a shorthand between the two of you? Do you sort of like, I mean, do you have a way well, of for talking? For sure, or? even what you said, I don't think, I, I would have never been, they're giving me this credit of being brave and stuff. I wouldn't have been like that if we hadn't worked together before. I would have been so nervous that you were scared of me or, because it's even for Numi and I, when the movie's over, your work is at this really rich place. Mm. You want to almost want to start again because yeah. it does. It takes a while to build trust. And, mm. and so Robert and I got to jump in at already on second base. Mm. And I think I love working with people again. There's a trust there and a relaxation. And you know what your weak spots are. Okay, I had trouble with him. But on that the made me feel really safe because both of you had such a strong relationship. So it was something, it felt like a play. It totally mm -hmm. felt like I did a lot of stage work. That was my school when I was younger. And this was almost coming back to that world. Of, it was so intimate. So it, we kind of became really close. It felt like it was just our own little bubble. Have you ever found yourself on set um, making, making a movie or working with a director where you don't feel safe? Like that? We, yeah. yeah, we're not allowed to talk about that. Yeah, because no, 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 I know they, names. they I might want... offer me a job later, and yeah. I want the job, you know. But uh, I don't want names or movies. I just say, like, curious how you deal with that experience, or how you how you give the best performance that you feel like you can give when you don't feel like you have the range to explore. Yeah, the world is full of creeps. Uh, do, do you know? <laughs> don't, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, yes, uh, producers, true. directors, I mean, totally. actors. Yeah, this yeah. is rare. <laughs> yeah, a, a lot of. You have to have a, a suppleness and a willingness to <laughs> play with each other. And Robert was very good at creating an environment where he empowered Numi and I. He trusted us. Mm. Um, you had came in with a real strong hit on that character. And I've worked with directors 
that they just get scared as soon as you have a hit. You get, they get scared you're going to ruin their shot list. You're gonna, what do you mean you're going to wear big glasses? What do you mean? The one, there's, a, there's this scene, unbelievable scene, and my favorite scene in the movie is the scene where Numi talks to her husband. When she, you know, I have her hostage, and she's talking to her husband. It's a really unexpected, strange scene that, that Numi had a real hit on. And, and, and Robert went with that. And, they, and a lot of directors are constantly resisting the character you're coming up with. And what happens is we both lose. Because yeah. the director doesn't get a fully lived in performance. And the act, it's somehow. Like you said about the actor who rehearsed it in the mirror and then thought that he was going to yeah. be able to do that when he got set. The director's kind of doing it's the a same thing. Good things happen from clap. My favorite Brando quote is that when it's going well, you, you, you spiritually marry your director and your, your co conspirators. That you're somehow, when you said it was intimate, it was intimate. And that's what you're striving for, that you're in some imaginative place together. Mm. It's not my movie, it's not your movie. It's not I mean, for so many times I felt like I didn't even know where the camera was. It was know, just I like know. kind of catching us and we were exploring the scenes and every take was different. Mm -hmm. I mean, every mm -hmm. take you do is like totally different. <laughs> yeah. So we were just like, I was kind of, it was like a dance almost. Can you talk about that recipe scene? Because that recipe scene is a moment in the movie where, I mean, Initial, like right away when we meet Ethan's character, we get a sense that you know we can laugh and that this is going to be a kind of comedy. But the recipe scene is a moment where I felt like as a viewer, it's the moment where you lean in and go, "Wait, what? What's happening? Yeah. This, this, okay, this movie's different than than what I thought it was going to be." And then the movie kind of keeps doing that, like a good like a good film does. Can you talk about writing that scene and knowing that it was right because it is kind of tangential? One of the things that struck me about the story um, was the relationship between Numi's character and her husband and family and just the reality, you know, I'm, I'm a married guy now with a couple kids and there's a certain point in your life that um, everything becomes about admin. And I always wondered like, does it st stay like that even when humans are in these like survival situations? And in the article, I read that it did. I mean, that character was mostly concerned with what her kids would eat that night. And, and I think it normalizes one to kind of think like that. That that character wanted to pretend that life was still normal. So that scene, to me, captured also the tone in a lot of ways, the absurdity, but then the kind of pathos and seriousness of so much. Um, and like Ethan said, it was a scene that Numi um, quite jumped on and kind of reworked herself too. And and because it was, you know, the food is quite Swedish, and so Numi had some some great ideas on the nuance of that, and I love that when I can write something and then an actor can kind of personalize it and take it. It means that it's like the full collaboration, and so I think that's why it works so well, because you were able to bring that. Right, you're not the director who goes, mm, that's not what's on the page here, Numi, even though I'm not Swedish. Well, yeah, I mean, what do I know about Swedish food? I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, that was also one of the first conversations we had, and what you said about Rob, I mean, on, from your previous film, that it's that he's a, a director who loves actors, and for me to be invited into your, to what you had and what you came from, felt like a great honor. And you know, that side of you is just very unique. And you, and the other problem with working with people who are friends is sometimes a laziness can creep in. But Numi is so that whatever the opposite of lazy is is what Numi is and she has a ferocity to ask us questions that kept us on our and made us sharp so you weren't just familiar and oh let's work with a guy I really like let's have fun it was you came in and every, had a million questions over every detail and that inspires people to be better you know, um, I saw you in True West this year. Incredible mm -hmm. performance. Oh, and thanks. Like, an extremely unpredictable performance. I feel like I had seen that done before, both professionally and students. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes there's the same take on that role because it's written a certain way. Everyone thinks they have to go at it that way. And you found a way to hit that role in consistently surprising ways, whether it was changing your voice or going small when it should go big or big when it was small. Was that the purpose of doing that for you? Was that was that one of the one of the reasons that you took on that role was so that you could find a new way to do it? People like to, I mean, for me, I, I don't know what other people do, but it's not an intellectual. Th when something is working, I kind of think it's a heart thing. You, it, your head has to prepare. Your head has to get ready. Your head has to think about what she might wear, what your my character might wear. But if the writing is good, and if you're ready, it becomes a heart situation where you're just kind of shooting from your heart and and you let it happen to you and uh 
that's when I think, when the play plays you, you know, if, if I come in and go, I'm gonna play Hamlet, and I have an idea that he's got a mommy complex, and well, you know, and I have this intellectual idea, and, and, and you, you can apply it, but then the whole thing is rigged a little bit. Whereas what you wanna do is do all that experience. Yeah, read what Freud said about Hamlet, sure. And then forget it and just play and play. But, but you, it's, a weird, it's a combination of preparation and playfulness. If you're not prepared, right, and you just play, well, then it's a mess, mm. you know? But if, if you're really prepared and you don't play, then it's stilted and intellectual and there's no... For but it's almost about like filling your body with information and like research or whatever and then let go and just see what, like what the marriage is on the day yeah. <laughs> between so those two worlds. That's the, how I approach True West is the same way I, I approach this, which is to try to really just think about the person and how they intersect with me. You know, what would I, if, if I were to rob a bank, you know, I wouldn't know what, I mean, just really play the reality of that and how crazy it would be. I mean, and that's what, uh, I mean, my, with you and watching you work, it, feel, it felt so real. So I was watching him as Bianca has known me and just like, Oh my God, I just feel sorry for him. Kind of want to help him hold his gun for him. You know what I mean? Because it's so human what you do. Uh, I think we have some time for questions from the audience. Oh, hey, right here. Hi. Um, looking back, how was your experience working on that uh, Freud Society? And how was it to work with Robin Williams? Well, if we're talking about spontaneity and creativity, Robin Williams, it's an overused word, the word genius. But he was a comic genius. There's, I mean, meaning there aren't two of him. You never knew what he was going to do. I mean, he, he, to do an interview like this with Robin, mm. I mean, he didn't say anything. He just, he would move around. He'd be sitting over there. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was so unexpected and wild. And that was my first real experience with the great actor, right? It's, and, and so I would watch this unpredictability wow. and, and the electricity that vibrated through him. And I, only now do I start to realize what an impact that had on me. To watch, because you know Peter Weir, who directed that film, was he's an Australian director. He's a great filmmaker, and I, when you're young, you take lots of things for granted. I just thought that's what a director was like, mm. you, you know. But he, I realize now that oh, he was a master at his craft, and Robin was truly exceptional, you know. And so his effect on me was profound. Next question. Hi. Um, this is to both of you. Uh, what was your, I know you touched on a bit, but what was your experience like portraying real life people versus your process when you're playing like fictional characters and if there were any challenges that you faced in this particular movie? I mean, um, as I said, I grew up in Sweden, so I was very aware of those people, but Bianca is actually two of the women kind of merged into one. So you created a fictional character based on two women. So, and it was kind of gave me a freedom, which was nice. Because otherwise, I know that I will be so compared, and they will be sitting there and like watching. Is like, is it done the right way? Um, and I felt like that was something you gave us through, even if it's based, it's based on a, on, on on real events. It's not like straight. I mean, right? Yeah, that was the idea. Yeah, which gave us freedom to kind of give them our lives and and us. One of the things that's dangerous when you play real people is you think that because it really happened, it's entertaining. You know, our job, it's not a nonfiction piece. There are documentaries about this event. You can find them. You can find the real events. But we didn't want to do a reenactment. We wanted to say something about people and use this story as a launching pad. Explore pattern. Stockholm yeah. Syndrome. What Ex is exactly. that? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And not to do a literal reenactment of that robbery. We're exploring what Stockholm Syndrome is through these altered fictional versions based on a real life thing. So the fun of that is we have all these real life details we can steal without the obligation of doing, mm. you know, a by the numbers reenactment. Ethan, what's your shirt? What's your t-shirt? Is that Hawk Records? No, uh, Sex, Sex Hawk, Hawk Black, Black uh, Records. It, it, oh, okay. it's, um, I was like, wait. I, I, I did, I, I, here's the thing is when you, can't, when, when you can't be a rock and roller anymore, you have to produce rock and roll. And uh, no, I did a movie with this uh, actor, Ben Dickey, and Charlie Sexton is world-class guitarist, and Lewis Black, who started South by Southwest, and Austin Chronicle is great um, arts writer. We fell in love with Ben Dickey, and we produced his album. It's called Glimmer on the Outskirts, and so this is my record label, Sex Hawk Black. 
Ben, and, Bendis uh, who played Blade. Blade ben Dickey right? played Blaze, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was kind of our thing of, uh, his music is also incre incredibly beautiful, and we wanted to launch his record into the world too. And so, is it out yet? Yeah, Glimmer on the Outskirts. It just came out, and it's a really good album. Amazing. You can find I, yeah, it on no, Sex Talk Black Records. <laughs> he was uh, he was incredible in Blaze. Yeah, yeah I really want to hear his work. Uh, one more question. Numi, Robert, uh, Ethan, I want to say thank, uh, congrats for the film. It looks really good. It looks like a fun ride. This question is for Ethan. I want to say thank you for your contributions. You know, I've been a fan of you since training day. And I want to know if, the, were there any, like, unpredictable times on that set, working alongside Denzel and Snoop Dogg? Are you kidding? You know, I mean, you know, <laughs> Denzel is, you know, one of the greatest actors of all time. And uh, unlike, you know, this... There's very few American actors who are movie stars and actors. There's some that are amazing movie stars, and there's some that are amazing actors. But Denzel's been a movie star for 30 years. It's an incredibly difficult thing to pull off, being a populist artist, you know, where you're making mainstream, entertaining art at an extremely high level. And he's also a world-class actor. And he's also carrying the weight of race in America. Right, which is something, a whole other conversation of a weight that he's carried like it was effortless his whole career. And he was the first time I really, you know, he's a dramatic actor, right? And he is so, it's a little bit, I wouldn't compare it. You remember when you're a senior in high school, when you're the oldest person in your class and you don't care what anybody thinks, you don't care what the teachers say, you don't care what the other students, Denzel walks through life like that. <laughs> like it's, it, he just has that kind of confidence. Yeah. And it's so wonderful, when you see it and you witness it, um, it does really positive things around him because you see what confidence can do. And it's very hard when there's a lot of money being spent, big business, Hollywood movies, it's really hard to be creative. With money comes a lot of fear just all this fear, all this pressure. Oh, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. We're going to lose. We're going to lose. And he just erases all that fear. And it feels like you're making a little art movie with one of the greatest artists of all time. I mean, and, cause it, meaning it's that creative. He, he, it's, you know, his performance in Flight, for example, that was an incredible performance. If that's any other actor in the world, that's like a little movie. It's like a little movie that gets released at Sundance mm -hmm. and... You know, and uh, two people see it. But with Denzel, it's all of a sudden a giant, it's a movie that can play in malls across the world. They can do an iconic sequence where the plane turns upside down. Yeah, it's, you know, it, like it, it's and I just say that I, he showed me what, you know, it, it's a little, I don't know how to say, he showed me what a great actor looks like. Mm -hmm. And I got to work with him really closely. So I got to see what, it's one thing just to watch the finished performances, but when you get to see how the pizza's made, or whatever that expression is, you know. Uh, um, it's, it, you never unsee that. It's interesting not to have a Denzel love fest really fast, but I was just reading an interview where he was brought up and Fences was brought up, and how much we kind of took for granted when that movie came out that he brought fence, he brought August Wilson and Fences to the masses. That was playing in malls across America. If movies I mean, still play in malls, I don't know. People, Some people sort of cineplex for, thing. People forget what he's accomplished. When they get so, it's a little bit like Bob Dylan or just yeah. a really great artist. You, there's a tendency to take it for granted, you know, because, oh, it's him being great again. Oh, yeah. another, another great performance. Um, but I don't take it for granted. And you don't take it for granted because you're asking about it. Yeah. Uh, well, guys, I love Stockholm. Thank you so much for being here, and congratulations on the film. It opens today in theaters. Uh, is it wide? What's the release? Platforms here, and then it goes wide uh, over the next couple of weeks. Amazing. Uh, everybody, give them a huge round of applause for being here. Thank you. Thank you. you.